Welcome everyone to Too Good to Be True. Thank you for taking the time to listen. The subject of today's show is Roanoke and other Elizabethan mysteries. Before we start getting into details, let's just briefly talk about psychic insight and how we apply it. We choose a subject, then research the background, and based on that research, we determine what we think needs to be explained by creating a series of questions. Then Justina provides psychic insight to answer those questions. The psychic insight is narrated towards the end of the show. Accepting the psychic insight is a question of individual belief. Now let's go through the disclaimers. Here are the disclaimers. Neither of us claim to have any expertise in any subjects that we discuss. We relate information we find through research and the psychic insight. We are always delighted to hear from the listeners. The show only lasts an hour. We don't have the time to present exhaustive research on any topic. This means that there will be information that we miss. We want to provide a basis for the psychic insight. We don't care if a theory turns out too good to be true, as the show name suggests. We are only interested in finding out more of the truth about topics. Spirit can only relate insight that is appropriate for our time in history. Free will cannot be affected. Only comments that are appropriate for our time can be given through the psychic insight. Much of the subject matter in shows may have already been covered many times in other media. We want to look into subjects in a new, different way and be thought-provoking. We are not so good with pronouncing names, we apologize. And neither of us have any particular knowledge of history, literature, or the occult. If we have misstated anything, we apologize. This is really a joint suggestion. You're interested in William Shakespeare's plays and whether Francis Bacon actually wrote some of them. I'm interested in learning more about what happened at the Roanoke Colony and more about the original 007 John D. He may have had a role in the destruction in 1588 of the invasion fleet, the Spanish Armada. There is a strange story that doesn't seem to be accepted by many, but what, or, but was Queen Elizabeth the first actually crowned as an imposter? Elizabeth the first was the last of the Tudors born in 1533 and reigning from 1558 to 1603. She never married. There was no heir to continue the Tudor line. Possibly after Elizabeth I's father, Henry VIII's six marriages, including two executions, marriage didn't seem like a good idea. Well, before we discuss Elizabeth I, let's begin with the Roanoke colony. Yes, Wikipedia provides the bare facts as follows. Quote, the Roanoke colony, also known as the Lost Colony, was established in 1585 on Roanoke Island in what is today's Dare County, North Carolina. It was a late 16th century attempt by Queen Elizabeth I to establish a permanent English settlement in North America. The colony was founded by Sir Walter Raleigh. The colonists disappeared during the Anglo-Spanish War, three years after the last shipment of supplies from England. Their disappearance gave rise to the nickname the Lost Colony. There is no conclusive evidence as to what happened to the colonists." So Walter Raleigh was a famous explorer who introduced the potato and tobacco into Europe from North America. His marriage to one of Queen Elizabeth's maids of honor enraged the jealous Elizabeth, who had the couple imprisoned in the Tower of London for a short time. Maids of honor had a different definition then from today. They were members of a court with lower ranking than ladies in waiting. How many colonists were there and when did they arrive in the New World? Here is a quote from the History Channel website. In 1587, Englishman John White led more than 100 men, women, and children in the first attempt to found a permanent English colony in New World. The group settled on Roanoke Island, one of the chain of barrier islands now known as the Outer Banks, off the coast of North Carolina. Later that year, White headed back to England to bring more supplies, but England's naval war with Spain would delay his return for nearly three years. When he finally arrived on Roanoke Island on August 18, 1590, White found the colony abandoned and looted with no trace of the settlers. Only two clues remained. The word Croatoan had been carved on a post and the letter CRO scratched into a tree trunk, unquote. 115 people disappeared, but, without, but no human remains were found. What theories are there for no traces of the settlers being found in the 1590 on John White's return? Not many, as the History Channel website relates. Here's more from that source. Quote, based on the scant clues left behind, some speculated that Native Americans attacked and killed the English colonists. 
Croaton was the name of an island south of Roanoke, now Hatteras Island, which at the time was home to a Native American tribe of the same name. Alternatively, they might have tried to sail back to England on their own and have been lost at sea or killed by hostile Spaniards who came north from their own settlements in Florida. One enduring theory was that the settlers might have been absorbed into friendly Native American tribes, perhaps after moving further inland into what is now North Carolina." Unquote. The Roanoke colony was 50 miles from Hatteras Island. I would have thought that the word Croatoan having been carved on a post would be a message pointing to where the settlers were going after having abandoned the colony. But the article goes on to discuss the existence of archaeological remains, suggesting some of the Roanoke colonists may have split into two groups. Artifacts including pottery and a ring have been found at Albemarle Sound, away from the Hatteras Island, and at Cape Creek on Hatteras Island. The two groups may have been assimilated into different Native American communities. But now it's, it is time for the strange story of Queen Elizabeth I being crowned as an imposter. I'm all in favor of hearing a strange story, even if it's from long ago. The story was put into print by Bram Stoker in the 19th century. Stoker became famous for creating the fictional character Count Dracula. He came up with a theory after visiting the village of Bisley in the Cotswold Hills in central southern England. The local tradition for the May Day celebrations was that the May Queen would be a boy dressed in Elizabethan clothing. The website History Mysteries gives an account of supposed events. Quote, the story unfolds like this. It is known that Elizabeth was sent away at the age of 10 to a village called Bisley to avoid an outbreak of the bubonic plague in London. It was hoped that being away from the metropolis where people were dying left and right would ensure that she did not succumb to the disease. Unfortunately, an unknown illness soon caught Elizabeth in its clutches and she died. Soon after it was announced to the household that King Henry VIII would arrive in Bisley in the near future and would visit his daughter, unquote. There were bubonic plague outbreaks in the 16th century. Elizabeth was born in 1533. There was a severe outbreak in 1563, but this would have been long after Elizabeth had been moved from London to Bisley. A record of an earlier outbreak would have been helpful to the story, but the account continues on the Hist Historic Mysteries website. Quote, Elizabeth's nurse panicked. Would the king blame her for her, his daughter's death? If so, would she be punished? Would she lose her head? The nurse came up with a bold plan. Bury Elizabeth secretly and find a local girl who closely resembled Elizabeth and present the imposter to the king as his daughter. She quickly searched busily for a 10-year-old girl with a fair complexion and, most importantly, red hair similar to Elizabeth's, but none were found. But the nurse did find an effeminate young boy who looked somewhat like the dead royal. The nurse had no other choice. She dressed the boy in Elizabeth's clothing and added a wig and prayed that the king wouldn't notice any difference. If this theory is true, the king apparently did not notice the deception and the young boy would grow into manhood and would eventually rule the kingdom, unquote. That all sounds very far-fetched. Was there any supporting evidence? I don't think there's any definitive evidence, but in the 1800s, there was a report of a coffin discovered in Bisley, which contained the skeleton of a young girl dressed in the clothes typical of the upper classes from the Elizabethan era. The princess's style of letter writing was supposed to have changed after visiting Bisley. Also, Elizabeth made her doctor swear not to perform an autopsy after her death. On the other hand, it is hard to believe that Henry VIII would not have noticed an imposter. What did Elizabeth look like in portraits? She had an oval face like her mother Anne Boleyn and doesn't look that masculine. In 1562, Elizabeth contracted smallpox. After that, to cover scarring, she used white makeup made of lead and vinegar. What were Elizabeth's views of marriage? She was famously quoted at age eight, stating she would never marry. But marriage at that time would be for political reasons, like the union of a union of her sister to King Philip of Spain, Elizabeth's future enemy. If married, Elizabeth could lose power and independence. Philip and Mary had ruled England jointly until Mary died aged 42 in 1558. I think it is time to move on to William Shakespeare as nothing will come of nothing. You had to look that up, didn't you? Wikipedia provides a brief summary of the life of William Shakespeare. 
William Shakespeare was an English poet, playwright, playwright, and actor, widely regarded as both the greatest writer in the English language and the world's preeminent dramatist. He is often called England's national poet and the Bard of Avon. His extant works, including collaborations, consist of approximately 39 plays, 154 sonnets, two long narrative poems, and a few other verses, some of uncertain authorship. His plays have been translated into every major living language and are performed more often than those of any other playwright, end quote. He has no estate to receive any royalties, which would bring in millions of dollars every year. His best-known plays include Hamlet, Macbeth, and Romeo and Juliet. The plays were comedies, histories, or tragedies. Where did you find the idea that Francis Bacon wrote some of the plays? I just read a few articles. It's a theory that seems to pop up now and again. The main argument was that there was nothing in the life of William Shakespeare to suggest that he was educated enough to write the plays that he did. I think we'll have to continue on after the break, Justina. Yes, we'll talk about William Shakespeare and how maybe he didn't write his own work after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xcbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, sci-fi, and horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Welcome 
welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were just discussing William Shakespeare and the theory that seems to pop up once in a while that William Shakespeare didn't actually write all his work. Yes, uh, I must admit in the past I'd heard Bacon's name suggested as well as that of Christopher Marlowe, a well-known playwright and author from the same era. Famous American author and humorist Mark Twain was outspoken about Shakespeare not being a real author. Twain was factual in that little is known about Shakespeare's life, which is strange given all his fame. He also pointed out that the true author must have understood the law and could have only been a veteran of the legal profession. Let's look again at Shakespeare's life, but from another source. Here is part of Shakespeare's bio from Biography Online, and I quote, William Shakespeare was born in Stratford-upon-Avon on the 23rd of April, 1564. His father, William, was a successful local businessman, and his mother, Mary, was the daughter of a landover, landowner. Relatively prosperous, it is likely the family paid for William's education, although there is no evidence he attended university. In 1582, William, aged only 18, married an older woman named Anne Hathaway. They had three children, Susanna, Hamnet, and Juliet. Their only son, Hamnet, died aged just 11. After his marriage, information about the life of Shakespeare is sketchy, but it seems he spent most of his time in London writing and acting in his plays. Due to some well-timed investments, Shakespeare was able to secure a firm financial background, leaving time for writing and acting, end quote. There obviously isn't much detail. Shakespeare was part of the play company, The King's Men, who built the famous Globe Theater in London, where many of Shakespeare's plays were first performed. As a possible alternative author, the same article provides the name Edward Deaver, the 17th Earl of Oxford. There seems to be no shortage of possible alternative authors. Didn't Sir Francis Bacon have a very high profile during his lifetime, but not as an author? Yes, he did. Here is a brief bio from Wikipedia. Francis Bacon, first Viscard St. Alban, was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, jurist, orator, and author. He served both as Attorney General and as the Lord Chancellor of England. After his death, he remained extremely influential through his works, especially as philosophical advocate and practitioner of the scientific method during the scientific revolution, end quote. He died after contracting pneumonia following his investigation into the preservation of food by freezing it. Being appointed Lord Chancellor of England meant that he was at the pinnacle of the legal profession as he was responsible for the running of the entire national legal system. That would fit in with Mark Twain's profile of the playwright, but Mark Twain wasn't convinced that Bacon was the true author. With high office along with being involved in science, how would Sir Francis Bacon find time to write 39 plays, plus all the other literary works, literary works attributed to Shakespeare? I would suggest examining the evidence, but there only appears to be conjecture. The website Today Ticks summarizes the arguments for the three candidates that we have mentioned. Let's start with Sir Francis Bacon. According to today's Ticks, the case for Bacon is as follows. There are lots of small and large similarities in Bacon's published works and Shakespeare's plays. Bacon was well-educated, head of a literary society, and traveled often, all subjects that are in Shakespeare's plays. Bacon knew the science of ciphers, and experts believe they have decoded clues in the plays and elsewhere that point to Bacon as the real author. Next, sir, is Christopher Marlowe. According to the same website, the case is as follows, but I'm going to paraphrase. Specific words and phrases are common in both Shakespeare's and Marlowe's works. Marlowe officially died in a bar fight, but he may have faked his own death to continue writing in secret. In 2016, information scientists at the University of Pennsylvania conducted computer analysis and concluded that all three Henry IV plays contain language written by another author, with Christopher Marlowe as statistically the likeliest candidate. The, re the researchers are certain that Shakespeare didn't write the Henry IV plays as the sole author. Now let's move on to Edward de Vere. From today text, here's the case for Edward, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. Oxford was known by others for his beautiful poetry. The 17th Earl of Oxford traveled often, ran into pirates, and had wild experiences. 
many of which were depicted in Shakespeare's works. All the royals and elite audience members that were invited to Shakespeare's plays were all close friends of the Earl. De Vere's Bible was marked with passages, a large portion of which ended up in Shakespeare plays as references. The conflicting evidence that the De Vere died before all of Shakespeare's plays were finished is explained by plays having incorrect dates. There is also the theory that the works of Shakespeare were created by multiple authors rather than one individual pretending to be Shakespeare. There is the theory that those involved were in a secret society. But if there were a group of authors writing under the name of William Shakespeare, there might have to be a secret organization to pull it all off. On the subject of secrets, it's time to move on to the first 007, John D. In the tavern, did he drink his ale shaken, not stirred? Very funny. He might have had a hot poker put it in it to warm it up as mauled ale. I looked for a description of John D. and he must have been some sort of genius as well as spy. The John D. Society dedicated website, johnd.org, summarizes his accomplishments. Some of them are as follows with paraphrasing. He was visionary of the late British Empire, developing a plan for the British Navy. The first to apply Euclidean geometry to navigation, build instruments, train navigation and develop maps. Was able to converse with angels, being told that Britain would have an empire. Philosopher and astrologer to Queen Elizabeth. Founder of the Rosicrucian Order. Was an alchemist, adept in the, the esoteric, the occult and apparently in magic. Commissioned by a Queen Elizabeth to establish a legal foundation for colonization of North America. Creator of the largest library in England with over 4,000 books. And the originator of a hex to wreck the Spanish Armada, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Euclidean geometry is a type of geometry modern math students are familiar with. Apparently in Shakespearean plays, the character Prospero from The Tempest and the character King Lear from the play of that name are based on John D. I didn't mention his spying activity or the fact that he was supposed to have sold the Voynich manuscript for a lot of gold. We included the Voynich manuscript in another show. The original remains to this day untranslated in a library at Yale University. So what was John D.'s spying activity? The website books tell you why includes the following summary. Quote, D often corresponded with the Queen on confidential matters he took to signing his letters 007 to designate letters for the Queen's eyes only. The zeros represented eyes and the seven was thought to be a lucky number that offered protection. Many scholars believe that D was one of Elizabeth's spies and that travels through Europe were not for spiritual conferences, but rather to gather intelligence. It is known that Elizabeth employed a number of spies, especially after the Pope declared her an Ill illegitimate ruler in 1570. She was constantly threatened by conspiracy plots, all of which were quashed by her secret service. He would have been a formidable member of his team, of this team rather. His reputation for magic preceded him and he was obviously well connected through his position at court." Unquote. For James Bond, double O stands for license to kill and the seven was associated with a document associated with cracking the German diplomatic code during World War, World War One. It appears that 007 is just a coincidence. You didn't seem to pick up on John D's interest in the occult, conversing with angels, or his ability with magic. What are the occult and magic? Like Euclidean geometry, they can be difficult to explain. The, the occult is supernatural, mystical, or magical beliefs, practices, or phenomena. It looks like magic uh, is part of that occult, but the magic referred to is not like a stage magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Wikipedia explains these magics as follows as Enochian magic, quote, Enochian magic is a system of ceremonial magic based on the evocation and commanding of various spirits. It is based on the 16th century writings of Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly who claimed that their information, including the revealed Enochian language, was delivered to them directly by various angels. These journals contained the Enochian script and the tables of correspondences that accompany it. Dee and Kelly believed their visions gave them access to secrets contained within the Book of Enoch." Unquote. Edward Kelly was an occultist and self-declared spirit medium. He was also an alchemist who claimed to have the secret of turning lead into gold. 
It is claimed that he was able to make spirits or angels appear in an obsidian mirror, highly valued by John Dee. The Enoch referred to as the grandfather of Noah. The book of Enoch is not included in the Bible, but is re referenced in it. In 1948, texts in the book of Enoch were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. What is a obsidian mirror? John Dee's obsidian mirror is in the British Museum in London. Here is a description from the website Northern Renaissance. Quote, not much bigger than any standard hand mirror, the artifact is circular with a whole board handle at the top. Beautiful dark reflective, reflective black, it was forged from volcanic Mexican obsidian, which the Aztecs associated with their god Tezcatlipoca, Lord of Divina Divination. This is a ritual object and its exact provenance is unknown. Provenance is another word for origin and obsidian is naturally occurring volcanic glass. Well, after the short break, we'll have a little time left to discuss the Spanish Armada or the Spanish Invasion Fleet, but we'll have to continue after the short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media Day. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God, it was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, 
the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we are just going to start discussing the Spanish Armada or the Spanish Invasion Fleet. So, Dad, can you please start talking about this? Yes, the Armada was the largest military engagement of the undeclared Anglo-Spanish War from 1585 to 1604. Here's part of an article from the History Channel website. Quote, in May 1588, King Philip II dispatched the 130 ship of Spanish Armada on a mission to guide an invasion force to the coast of England and top of the regime of Queen Elizabeth I. This great and most fortunate navy was one of the mightiest fleets ever assembled, but a combination of poor tactics, robust English resistance and dismal weather ultimately doomed it to failure. By the time Philip's invisible armada finally limped back to Spain later that autumn, at least a third of its ships were lost and some 15,000 sailors had been killed. The article continues. The Armada was one of the largest fleets ever assembled for a single mission, but it was not intended to attack England on its own. The Spanish plan instead called for the Armada, sailing under the command of the Duke of of Medina Sidonia, to travel to the Flemish coast and rendezvous with with a 30,000-strong land army under the Duke of Parma, who would then act as a defensive escort and and a supply convoy as Palmer's troops crossing this channel on small barges and moved on to London, unquote. The defending tactics included sending in fire ships into the Armada when they were anchored off Calais, France, scattering the Spanish ships, and the weather did the rest. So some famous English weather helped prevent a Spanish invasion? Yes, some sources actually claim it was a hurricane, and an un- which is an unusual occurrence for northern Europe. If I'm correct, the next storm to hit Southern Britain, described as a hurricane, was in eight, it was in 1987. According to the website uh, SirBacon.org, the extreme weather might have had some help from John D. Quote: When the Spanish Armada loomed over the English Channel, it was D. as he as the wise sage who suggested to hold the course and be still. He had correctly anticipated the devastating storm would destroy the mighty Spanish fleet and that it would be best to keep the English ships at bay. Some have suggested that it was Dee himself who conjured up that storm, unquote. If that is true about John Dee, then he did possess some strange magical powers. But I wonder if events just unfolded as they were meant to. But why don't you ask the first question? Yes, I'll start with the Roanoke colony. When John Wright returned in 1590, did the word Croatoans carved on a post and the letter CRO scratched on, into a tree trunk show that at least some of the colonists intended moving to Hatteras Island? Yes. Did the lack of human remains indicate that the settlers abandoned the colony? Most of them, yes, not all. Were the colonists starving when they abandoned the colony? And there were political debates going on too, so that was another factor. So there were disagreements as well as lack of food. Correct. So obviously when people are starving, they're more inclined to be emotional. And so there were the butting of heads also. So the colonists left voluntarily. They weren't abducted or tried to sail back to England. Is that correct? That's correct. Did the settlers split into two separate groups to relocate in different locations? Yes. Were the settlers absorbed into Native American communities? Some of them, yes, not all. Did the two groups go to the later ar- archaeological finding sites at Albemarle Sand and at Cape Creek on Hatteras Island? For the most part, yes. Well, some of the settlers also decided to go off by themselves, so their remains would not be found in the same place. What was the reason for abandoning Rona? Was it to find food in better places? Yes, and more resources. So resources were getting scarce, including ones they needed for medicine, for basically their basic needs. So they decided to go off so they could not only find food, but also fulfill their other basic needs. What happened to the settlers that weren't absorbed into Native American communities? 
A lot of them basically wandered to other places. So they either joined other groups or they ended up just being by themselves where they didn't last very long like that. What led up to the settlers leaving Roanoke? Was there a complete falling out and breakdown of any organization? Complete breakdown of any organization. So basically there were a lot of people who wanted to lead and thought they had good ideas and that led to a lot of conflict. Did this arise because they expected to be resupplied? Yes. So they felt that they had been abandoned? Correct, and they also, they did not have all the skills to hunt and gather their own food, so they were not trained properly like they should have. How many of the 115 survived to be assimilated into local communities? Only about half. Are there descendants of some of the settlers living today? Yes, obviously some family lines stopped because of families dying off for different causes, but yes, there would be some descendants still. What can we learn from the experience at Roanoke? Basically, that groups of people will have conflicts, and it's very important to have one designated leader. And the problem is that leadership has to be very stern and resourceful, especially in a situation as stressful as they were put into. And also in any survival situation, basic survival skills need to be taught to everyone. So even the women, children, everyone needs to learn survival skills since you never know where, when they are going to come in handy. But a situation like they incurred would be very different today since there's so much technology, so many different places settled. So it'd be very rare for a situation like that to occur again. So the people today should consider themselves very lucky since food, shelter, the basic needs are widely available. Changing subjects to Elizabeth I, was a young Elizabeth sent away to the village of Bisley to avoid an outbreak of bubonic plague? Yes, basically for quarantine. Did the 10-year-old Elizabeth die of an unknown disease while at Bisley? Yes. That was not an answer I had expected. Uh, did Henry VIII arrive at the village soon after? Yes. Was the dead princess replaced by a boy of similar age and appearance? Yes. Why didn't Henry VIII notice the deception? He did, but things were kept under wraps. Did Henry VIII go along with it because he wanted to keep the house of Tudor going? Yes, and also because basically he was told to and he had to follow orders. Who was giving the orders? People in the background that wanted to make sure the public relations was the same as before. So you can think of them kind of what we think of today as PR people, are people who are working with the public to put on a very wholesome and leadership front. So they were in charge of making sure that everything seemed very much normal. So it's a bit like the royal family in Britain today. They put on a good image. Correct. Two years before going to Bisley, why did the eight-year-old Princess Elizabeth announce that she would never marry? Because she didn't want to. Those were her true feelings. Was there a coffin discovered in Bisley in the 1800s that contained the remains of a young girl in Elizabethan era clothes? Yes. Who did the remains belong to? Elizabeth. Why was Elizabeth's apparent imposter in rage when Walter Raleigh married one of uh, the maids of honour? Was it for reasons other than jealousy? No, just basically jealousy. So even as a male, the monarch was jealous? Yes. Did Princess or Queen Elizabeth survive the disease of smallpox? Yes. There are portraits of Elizabeth that make her look like her mother, Anne Boleyn, and make her look female. Were the portrait painters asked to make her look a certain way? Not exactly. The replacement lo looks not exactly like her, but very similar. So that goes back to that males can have very feminine features. So they choose a male just because at the time they wanted a male more in power since they felt that, that was something that was very significant to political events. However, obviously it wasn't portrayed as who it really was. So you can think of it as they wanted the power, but they also wanted the male mind behind the power. Are there any people in high places today that know the true story? Yes. Changing the subject to William Shakespeare. Why was Mark Twain convinced that William Shakespeare was not the true author? Basically because the work did not match up to the person, so the work was a lot different from how Shakespeare actually was. 
How was William Shakespeare able to become the world's best known playwright with a reported limited education? That's a very complicated question, but what can be said is that Shakespeare did have a lot of influence on his work and a lot of imagination, but he also had help as far as when it came to actually writing the ideas and portraying the ideas. Was William Shakespeare a capable businessman? Yes. Did Sir Francis Bacon write some of Shakespeare's works? What can be said is that outside people helped, but it can't can be confirmed who helped, but there was outside help. Did Christopher Marlowe fake his own death? No. Was the statistical analysis done at the University of Pennsylvania supporting Christopher Marlowe being a true author, a good indicator of the truth? Again, there help, but there's no one true author. I will ask this question anyway. Did Christopher Marlowe write some of Shakespeare's works? Helped put the ideas on paper, yes. I will ask this question anyway. Did Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, write some of Shakespeare's works? No. I think you've already answered this question. Were plays and other literary works attributed to William Shakespeare created with the help of multiple authors? Yes, but we'll have to continue with the questions and the psychic insight about Roanoke and other Elizabethan mysteries after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xcbn.net. heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well it is, but you can have it today right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers with the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci-Fi and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at SimulTV.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Exposé Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. 
From out of the woodwork, we'll take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we are going through the questions and the psychic insight about Roanoke and other Elizabethan mysteries. So, Dad, can you please continue with the questions? Yes, we're the authors that uh, helped Shakespeare part of a secret society. No. Were Sir Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, or Edward de Vere members of a secret society? No. Were some of the dates for Shakespeare's plays stated incorrectly? There were some issues in some publications, yes, but not overall, no. How did Shakespeare organize getting help from the, uh, these other writers? Was it part of a good business plan? Yes, it was a good business plan for all involved, and he did write some of his work himself. So the other authors did read some of his work, but it needed some different tweaks to it. So if you look at the evolution of Shakespeare's writings and what he authored, there's a significant difference between the original ones he wrote and the ones he wrote at the end. So Shakespeare really did have some talent. It was just that he had a lot of help. Yes, he had a lot of talent, but his reading and writing and portraying his ideas weren't completely 100% his. Is there anyone well known other than already mentioned who helped Shakespeare? No, not well known names, no. But there are people you can think of kind of like ghost writers that helped him. What does it matter if Shakespeare did not write all the works attributed to him if it is great literature? The problem is that then they think that William Shakespeare was a phony and his name is on very famous works that he did not write. However, it really does not matter since he obviously is not alive anymore. So it really does not make a difference who wrote it as long as the work is out there. Why are the works of Shakespeare so respected and so important even today? People seem to be drawn to them for many different reasons, and there seems to be two groups of people. So a group of people who really, really admire his work and try to understand it and to look more depth into it. And then the group of people who actually really don't like his work, and it comes across very bland and very surface-level type content for them. So that's the problem is that his work is used in a lot of schools, but there's two types of people and obviously everyone's going to read the work differently, but it just uses an example of basically of writing from the past and how past literature was written. And then there's also obviously the aspect of the plays too. Changing the subject to Dr. John D, did he help plan the future of the British Navy? Yes and no, not completely, but he had his own ideas, yes. Were John Dee's mathematical skills applied to developing navigation, navigational instruments, and to creating maps? Along with others, yes. Was John Dee able to converse with angels, being told that Britain would have an empire? Not really angels, but you could say the spirit world, yes. Was John Dee a philosopher, also astrologer to Queen Elizabeth, as well as founder of the Rosicrucian Order? In part of his life, yes. Did John Dee realize that Queen Elizabeth was actually an imposter? No. Was John Dee an alchemist, adept in the esoteric, the occult, and apparently in magic? Not exactly. He wouldn't really be called an alchemist, but more as someone who dabbled in different worship and ritual techniques. Was John Dee commissioned by Queen Elizabeth to establish a legal foundation for colonizing North America? No. Was John Dee creator of the largest library in England with over 4,000 books or being a, an owner at one time of the Voynich Manuscript? Yes. Is that yes to both? Yes. Was John Dee a spy working for Queen Elizabeth? Not really a spy, no. Was Queen Elizabeth threatened by plots against her life which were prevented by her secret service? Yes. Was the choice of 007 for the code number of the fictional spy James Bond just a coincidence? Yes. Is there such a thing as Enochian magic? In some people's minds, yes, but not in physical terms. It does not work. Was Edward Kelly a spiritual medium and alchemist? Yes. 
Was e Edward K. Kelly able to make spirits or angels appear in John Dee's Obsidian Mirror? No. Was John Dee's Obsidian Mirror of any use at all? It was special since it was made out of obsidian and was called that. But the obsidian of today is different. So that's where it gets complicated since alchemists, if you would want to call them that back then, only had a limited knowledge of elements and how different properties of different elements work. And also no one can really make a spirit appear since spirits have free will. So they will appear when they want to, not when you call them. Was Edward Kelly or John D capable of practicing a form of magic? You could call it magic, yes. So that is making things happen by paranormal means. Yes, but theirs was more a uh, dark paranormal means. So they were involved in spirits that were not the most positive. Yes, you could think of it as summoning them, such as using a Ouija board, but a very old, not exactly technique of summoning spirits. Where did John Dee get his obsidian mirror from? He made it. Did he get the raw material from Mexico? Yes. Changing subjects a little bit to the Spanish Armada, why did King Philip of Spain think it was so important to invade Britain? That was just the plan, and Britain was very intriguing at the time, especially with who was ruling and how much power they had. Was the bad weather that helped destroy the Spanish Armada actually a hurricane? Yes. Why did the British Navy stay in port when the Spanish Armada was sighted? Was it based on the advice of John Dee? In part, but it was also a military tactic they used, where it was more to be on the defensive side, not the offensive side. Did John Dee have supernatural knowledge of devastating weather on its way, or did he use magical powers to create the bad weather? He was not able to create weather, but he had some knowledge, so you could think of it as some predictions. But the problem of people who make predictions is, one, they're not always accurate, and two, you can't control which predictions you actually see. Was it not in the future that Spain was going to conquer Britain? You could say that. But that's how the path turned out. So yes, you could say the series of events led it to not happening. The reason behind the previous question is that a hurricane in that part of the world only happens about every 500 years. So it seems a very remote chance that a hurricane hit the Spanish Armada. It was what happened on the path. So odd weather things happen all the time. Because yes, you could say they're supposed to happen. What can we learn from the reign of Elizabeth I? The problem is with a lot of ruling and ruling in history is that it's very unique when a woman rules. And that can be even seen today where there are not many women in power and running countries and ruling countries. But from the ruling of Elizabeth, you can see that things are not as always as they appear to the public. So there might be things going on behind the scenes that nobody knows about since nobody accepts that the, those people would actually see the, and be aware of what is going on. And also there's a stigma associated with women ruling and the stigma needs to be lifted, especially right now in the place the world's in where women are capable of ruling and women can strive to become a leader and can strive to be the head. And there doesn't have to be this different stigma associated with being male and being male. You can be a ruler and more powerful. And as any ruler is even today, there's always more that goes on behind the scenes than nobody sees. So the, in the case of Elizabeth applies, even with a male imposter, the monarch, the monarch was seen as female. Yes. Going back to the subject of magic, does magic have to involve working with negative spirits? No. So there are obviously different people, such as you can think of Wicca, so people who do good things and do good magic. However, the term magic is used very loosely since magic can be defined as many different things depending on who you are, t you are talking to. So yes, there's magic, but in order to actually have magic, there has to be a belief in that magic, if that makes sense. So for example, let's just take a classic magician today. They're doing magic, but they're doing tricks to create that magic. It's the same type of deal where true magic has different tricks and those tricks are not always revealed. So there's magic in situations that are very paranormal to deal with magic. But the problem is the belief and also needs to be to needs to deal in positive ways. So there's dark magic. There are people who dabble in that also. That was the last answer. 
of some of the Roanoke, Roanoke colonists surviving to be assimilated into Native American communities too good to be true? That depends on what you are prepared to believe. It sounds like for the Roanoke colony, they just brought people over in a ship and then expected them to learn how to survive and also develop an organizational structure. But the colonists expected that supply ships and support would be available. The Bram Stoker story that Elizabeth I was actually replaced by a boy around her age had been re retold in the last few years, even in a British national newspaper. But it appears that the choice of a male was deliberate, along with Henry VIII being part of the conspiracy. I think it is going to remain a story unless there is a possibility of DNA testing the remains of Queen Mary I, which are buried in the same place as the remains of the person who was Elizabeth I, with both having been buried in Westminster Abbey. I don't see that happening with Queen Elizabeth I having a long and successful reign. But DNA testing was done to verify the remains of Richard III, who Shakespeare had portrayed as a villain. Shakespeare having ghostwriters. That doesn't seem so crazy. And finally, John Dee not actually being a spy and not associated with a fictional 007. That really ended a good story. Well, as always, we'd love to hear from the listeners and hear your thoughts about today's show, since I'm shocked about some of the answers. And there's a lot of information here, a lot of different stories, but they all seem to fit together in this odd way. So as always, you can go to our Facebook page at Too Good To Be True with the first T spelled T-W-O. And as always, thank you to the listeners and we look forward to next week's show. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. 
Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D O W S E R S dot com or call 1 877 Dowsing. That's 1 877 369 7464.